The internet has allowed us to create our own groups and cultures outside of some curated space from a business or something that is being curated or influenced by the mass media in general. Instead, we have, crea we have created spaces entirely of our own made by people and controlled by people and not influenced by businesses and money, but by whatever the people want. This is really powerful. Before you got looks from runways and events and powerful people, now any teenager or person in their bedroom can post a lookbook and advice, and it can be picked up by anyone. We've seen this culminate in a few different things. We've seen entire styles be born, styles be brought back, as well as the ability to enact actual change in the world through simple things like aesthetics. That's really interesting how through the power of fashion, we can help save the environment and we can help people heal from trauma. It's a powerful thing. And I think we need to make sure that we actually look at it and see if it's good or bad, how to help fix the bad if it is, because it definitely is there, and make sure that we don't make the same mistakes as the mainstream media has done and continue to perpetuate a lot of their very harmful ideals. Now this influence is coming in the form of aesthetics and aesthetic communities. Now aesthetics cover a lot more than just fashion. They cover the way that you decorate and the way that you want to, your house to look. It covers your lifestyle, even your beliefs. It covers activities and hobbies that you partake in. But today we're mostly going to be focusing on the fashion element and what is found within there. And the other stuff will be in a separate video later because this is a whole rabbit hole. <laughs> so aesthetic communities ultimately derive from mainstream fashion. They're taking clothing that comes from a lot of these big brands. They're being inspired by what our cultural understanding of what is fashion and what is aesthetically pleasing is so influenced by these big brands in the mainstream. This carryover has a lot of different things to it. While yes, sometimes it can be as minor as what textures go together and what colors go together and never wear denim on denim, it can also go down to what we find socially acceptable or social or beautiful and oftentimes this isn't just colors and textures but it can also come down to racism and fat phobia these are definitely things that need to be addressed and i think that it's a lot easier to address in aesthetics and aesthetic communities already in as we saw that aesthetics were on the rise I've seen plenty of callouts on them for these things. And I've also already seen a lot of effort to make a change in these things. As well as the fact that it's even being called out, all of that is progress and is much more than we see in the mainstream. And it has a lot more influence when you're calling out aesthetics in aesthetic communities rather than trying to call out the mainstream. The mainstream is comprised of businesses and People making decisions not based off of what is right or wrong or what change people want to see, but it's based off of money. It's based off of what will sell, what might get them cancelled, what might not work for them, what pleases the people who actually buy things, and that doesn't always mean that they keep in mind actual ethics. I mean, look at fast fashion. Fast fashion wouldn't be a thing if businesses actually cared about people, as sad as that is. With aesthetics, these accounts are, as far as I'm aware, being run by singular people. And so it's a lot easier to get through to them about why it's important to include this kind of representation in what they're doing, because these are individuals who are doing something they enjoy and are a lot more likely to listen when you say, hey, this is morally wrong and we should change it just because morals. And I think we see this especially with racism and seeing different races represented in aesthetic communities. I feel like it's some of the best representation that I've seen <laughs> in the fashion world has come from people online and social media or small businesses showing representation. Because again, these accounts are being run by people. 
So these people get to choose what image they're portraying. They get to choose how they're described. They're not fit into boxes that this business wants to put them in. They're not called on every once in a while so that they can have that diversity point. No, this is this person's whole account. It's their whole thing. Their whole life is obviously being them. So the diversity that we do see is so much more meaningful and wonderful in aesthetics. And I think that especially because it was called out, I think people are making a lot of effort to support these people. Like especially my Asian queens, I see you guys all over fashion Instagram and I love it. I love it so much. And I've seen so many new accounts popping up of people who are POC and are doing fashion and they're I think that is the right approach, is not canceling aesthetics and saying you can't have these communities around these things because you're not being inclusive. That just pushes out the people who you need in these communities. The people who are going to be pushed out by those statements of, hey, these people are racist and bad and you shouldn't be in these communities, are the diverse people, are the people who would bring that representation to the community. But instead, if you take the approach of embracing diversity, when these people enter the community, lift them up and help them, and don't just try to push all community, all aesthetics out, then you grow a community that fosters new diversity and new voices. And then it's the best of both worlds. You get to still have your aesthetics and you have wonderful representation and diversity. And maybe that is just hopeful thinking that we can just solve this with happiness and kindness and welcoming, but I genuinely don't see aesthetics leaving anytime soon. They are far too widespread to leave. So even if this isn't the best approach, I think it is the most effective approach to ensure that we still have diversity and representation in these communities um, because they're not going to leave <laughs> and so why would you just continue to perpetuate the problem and what i've been addressing is mostly with the racism aspect and having people of different races being represented something that i haven't seen so much was people of different sizes being represented it's definitely there there's not much of it and i think that's a shame and i think it has the same kind of approach that that I just stated of just welcoming people in and trying your best to usher in new voices. Although there is an amount that body positivity has been growing in aesthetic communities even without necessarily a full range of sizes being represented. Something that really spoke to me was when a bunch of models or like Instagram models were showing what they looked like in their photos versus what they actually looked like when they weren't just doing all the poses and stuff in order to look that way. And I feel like movements like that and how big that was are also really important for, for body positivity and showing, breaking down this idea that you need to reach this kind of body because that body does not exist ever unless you are modeling and posing and photoshopping. And that really, I think, helped a lot of people see that deconstructed. And I know that some people complained because they, they were still skinny girls. Um, but I don't, I don't think that it should be erased because even skinny girls struggle with their body image and struggle because they don't look like a model all the time. And so I, I don't think that just because it doesn't speak to everyone that it, stuff like that should be disregarded. It's still an important step and it still helped people and I don't think it's negative overall at all. And something important too with this critique is I feel like the critique is somewhat not unfounded in the fact that it is true there is a lack of diversity, but unfounded in that there's only so much that certain creators can do. A lot of these accounts are people showing themselves and their wardrobes, and they literally cannot show something that they are not because the account is them and they are not diverse <laughs> and so there's a degree in which there can't be change other than bringing in new people like we can't expect those people who do exist to have diversity where it can't because then you get the whole weird thing where people tan like crazy and pretend to be not white when they just are white and it's we don't want that either <laughs> so like i just think overall it's about ushering new voices and not trying to destroy or push around what already exists
Aesthetics have also done a lot to add a lot more meaning to fashion and using it to enact social change beyond just like looking pretty. Although, who doesn't like to look pretty? <laughs> And it's very reminiscent to me of like a few different like prominent eras where this was happening like 1950s early Japanese street fashion and the 1920s just it just history repeats itself because humans are humans <laughs> so in the 1950s we're gonna mostly be focusing on that um it was kind of the first time in the US that we were seeing teens kind of have their own culture. People were coming back from World War II, and teens were finally being given jobs for pocket money <laughs> rather than to make sure their family didn't starve. And so we see this group be born where when you're around high school-ish, you enjoy different music and different fashion than your parents, but it's not quite the same as the younger kids. This is where we started to see people, and especially teens, use fashion as a way to say something about themselves, to show an affiliation with a certain group, or to pointedly not stand out at all. <laughs> Think of the classic trope of the preppy girl. So they dress in nice little sweaters with elegant little dresses, and they also would tend to be very polite and studious. And then look at the greasers with their leather jackets and their denim. They tended to be bad boys and would get into trouble all the time. Based off of what they were wearing, you could tell something more about themselves as a person. Sometimes it was even used to make a statement about something. Think back to the 1920s again. A lot, some of the flapper girls and all of that really like out their stuff for the time was in part to work for the women's liberation movement and to be groundbreaking and work towards women's rights. So you kind of see both of those things in aesthetic communities of not only does what you're wearing kind of say something about yourself. So let's look at academia. It's in the name. They got their blazers, they got their like matching neutral colors, and they're probably gonna be little bookworms and probably pretty shy. Maybe they're in debate team, but even debate people even debate team people can be shy, alright? I <laughs> I was in mock trial. <laughs> so it tells you something based off of what they're wearing, who they are as a person. But then look at cottage core. Cottage core is one of those ones that kind of wants people to step away from consumerism. So while you you they're gonna be wearing pretty little princessy dresses they probably like to bake, and also they are anti-consumerism and maybe even anti-capitalist. <laughs> you know something about them as a person, something that they enjoy, and they're fighting for some kind of social change being symbolized by what they're wearing. And there is a lot of different symbolism in various aesthetic communities. We have people trying to heal from trauma through aesthetics, we have people indicating something about their lifestyle through aesthetics, and we have ideals being symbolized by aesthetics. So let's look at some examples of those and how they further pull away from the mainstream and work for social change. So like I said with cottagecore, a lot of cottagecore people are anti-consumerism, and that's honestly kind of ironic that something based around fashion and that whole world can be anti-consumerism, but it's what's happening. Cottage core centers around respecting nature, not buying too many things, and only taking what you need, and not going into the consumerist ideals of just buying more and more and more, buying things that won't last, and not respecting nature because who needs nature when you got stuff? You can destroy the world. <laughs> We see a similar thing with Visco Girls, and Visco Girls in particular were a huge movement forward in environmentalism and minimalism as we see it today. They normalized reusable water bottles, the specifically hydro flask style water bottles, as well as reusable straws. And their whole thing was save the turtles. Now you can buy those things in just about any store and it's normalized. It's not something like, hey, what is that? What's going on there? It's just a reusable water bottle. 
it's just a straw. <laughs> we also saw businesses react to this change because it started being shown that marketing or products that were environmentally conscious or ethically sourced sold better. <laughs> More ethical small businesses and secondhand shopping has greatly been brought up. Think of the strawberry dress. That store blew up because aesthetic communities rallied around this cute ass dress. Reselling and thrifting has been greatly seen in these aesthetic communities as something you should do in a way that you can form this aesthetic best is through thrifting, secondhand shopping. And secondhand retailers grew 21 times faster than the traditional retail apparel market in the last three years alone. And what grew significantly in popularity about three-ish years ago? Visco girls, and with them, the rise of aesthetic communities. Aesthetics have also further helped to open up the conversation about mental health and trauma. When I was researching and having discussions about trauma core and kid core, I've had some of the most honest talks with people about their trauma. And I've learned so many new coping mechanisms and different things that I wouldn't have known otherwise without looking into these aesthetics and that are kind of being not popularized kind of seems like the wrong word, but like they are really helping to push out these different ways of coping to new people. And a lot of people say that these aesthetics have helped them get better and get through things. And for the longest time, mental health has been so stigmatized and it's been incredibly hurtful to countless people. Especially when it's dealing with things that are oftentimes perpetuated by the mainstream fashion world, it feels like just an extra middle finger to them that like, hey, these aesthetic communities are here, they're run by us, and we're gonna break down all these harmful things that you've created for us. And that just, we love that. We love that. And on a similar note, I think that aesthetics and their aesthetic communities and the amount of power that they hold right now to dictate what people buy, to dictate that ethical fashion needs to be something that is grown upon, is so empowering. And guess what? To all those people who are like, oh, capitalism, it's, about to, it's run by the people, even though capitalism is failing the people right now, this is the perfect example of what capitalism is meant to be like. It's meant to be that us, the consumers, can actually dictate what we want to buy. And this feels like one of the f first times in a long while where that's actually happening, where we're actually having the power to do so. And so, even though I want to dismantle the system, this is an example of the system kind of actually working, although purely through brute force of a bunch of people being like, no, we're going to have a say. <laughs> but hey, maybe it's us just marinating the rich so that we can eat them. So yeah, aesthetics are super rad and another way for Gen Z to find their own way in the world and rebel and break down the system. <laughs>